dynasties come out of nowhere in sports. And we thought the Miami Heat, LeBron, D-Wade, Chris Bosh, going to last forever. That lasted one-third of the San Antonio Spurs. Tom Brady, Belichick. Belichick been fired in Cleveland. He was 5-11. and 11. Tom Brady comes in for an injured Drew Bledsoe, 18-year dynasty. Both came out of nowhere. Coach K at Duke, he was barely 500 as a head coach at Army. Joe Torre was a, an announcer on television for the California Angels. He had a losing Major League record. He got the Yankee job. They won four out of five World Series. Probably the best baseball teams ever. Amazon sold books. They now rule the world in retail. Netflix sent you DVDs in the mail. They're the number one disruptor in American television history. Pete Carroll was considered a joke hire at USC. Dabo Sweeney was a wide receiver coach at Clemson. Dynasties come from nowhere. You're like, how did, what, I don't under... The Indianapolis Colts at the start of next year will be on a 10-year dynasty. The Indianapolis Colts have the best young general manager in football. A star quarterback now in a very reasonable contract. Nine draft picks. Van Der Esch is not the best young linebacker in football. Darius Leonard of the Colts, a rookie, led all players in tackles by a wide margin. Their offensive line is the best young offensive line in football. Andrew Luck went 11 and 5, 11 and 5, 11 and 5 with no support. Since week six to seven, he finally got healthy. Here it comes. You better beat them this weekend. You better beat them this weekend. Because I'm telling you, New England's rain, Brady's not getting younger, and Pittsburgh's dysfunctional. Watch out. Here it comes. All right, uh, you know, as we have four great games this weekend, you know, there's always been this confusion. The audience thinks we're rooting for this, we're rooting for that, we're rooting for big market, we're rooting for small market. The highest-rated NBA Finals ever, I think, was Michael Jordan against the Utah Jazz, and everybody was predicting nobody would watch because Utah's a small city, but it was a great story, and it was Michael Jordan with a 100-degree temperature and the Utah Jazz with his pesky team that gave Jordan trouble, and there was all sorts of drama. Ratings come from stories, not market size. Okay, that's the reality of it, is that Boston and the Patriots, um, this has been a dynasty. Alabama is a dynasty. It's not always big markets that control sports or get the ratings. It's the best stories. So the Utah Jazz Michael Jordan finals w was the highest rated finals of all time. Michael had played Barkley in the Suns. And you'd think that would be a huge rating because Barkley was a star. That was a little Utah Jazz. And so this weekend, if, if, if it was up to me that I was rooting for the best stories, because the best stories mean I'll get better ratings, the numbers inflate, more people watch our show, we can keep build a bigger staff. We're rooting for the most interesting stuff to happen. So when you get up Monday morning, you're like, yeah, let's just see what uh, Joy and Colin have to say. That's what we're rooting for. We're rooting for interesting. So let's go through all four games. What would be the most interesting outcome? Kansas City at Indianapolis. I believe the most interesting outcome is a shootout between the next Brady and Manning for the next 10 years. Patrick Mahomes and Andrew Luck are going to go toe to toe. And I want a shootout. And I want Kansas City winning. And I want the MVP winning. And I want Andy Reid winning. And I think it's 34 33. And it's, this is Peyton Manning and Tom Brady early in their careers. Obviously, Mahomes younger than Andrew Luck. But I want Mahomes to be flashy and no look passes and left handed passes and be a contrast of styles. That Mahomes comes out, he is Brett Favre. He makes a real bonehead interception. He makes some mistakes, but he has two or three unbelievable all time highlight plays. Meanwhile, Andrew Luck is 28 for 34. Uh, he is workmanlike. A contrast of styles. He is boring, and he is leading them down the field, and the clock runs out, and Kansas City wins a wild shootout, and we have a sense when the game is over, oh, my God, we are going to see this a lot for the next decade. A Kansas City narrow win in a shootout gets everybody fired up because we know the Chiefs are going to be around for a while, and we know the Colts with nine draft picks on top of this and $100 million, they're going to be really good starting next year. But this one we give to Kansas City, and then they go back and forth. Okay, Dallas and the Rams. What's the most interesting outcome, Dallas and the Rams? Dallas upsets the Rams, and Dak is not good. 
Zeke runs for 150. The Cowboy defense is great. And Dak Prescott struggles. And for the next four months, six months, nine months, ah, what do we do with Dak? We're winning the division. We're winning playoff games. He's Alex Smith. Oh, what are we going to do if we pay him? And by the way, the glitzy Rams give me all sorts of stories. Sean McVay, 0-2, both at home, in the playoffs, both as a heavy favorite. And the shiny new techie toy, eh, it doesn't really work in January. And Sean McVay is maybe a little more style than substance. I don't believe that to be true. But Kansas City in a shootout winning, Dak playing poorly and the Cowboys winning and getting the NFC championship. And an equally big story is the Rams are a lot of glitz and they paid for all these big stars and it ain't working, brother. And uh, ooh, all those teams that uh, picked off that <laughs> Sean McVay tree, you're going to be a little concerned. How about New England Chargers? We said this yesterday. The Chargers don't beat New England. They beat them 33-14. Tom Brady is overwhelmed, sacked six times. The Chargers have better players. You start to question Belichick's arrogance, letting Brandon Cooks go, Josh Gordon, leaving Tom with nothing. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Dynasty is over. Tom Brady going to retire. Belichick getting heat. We have another offseason where we question the dynasty going forward. Not just a Charger win but an overwhelming performance where the road-weary Chargers go on the road, you watch the game for three and a half hours and come to the conclusion, it's over. Kind of like that Bama-Clemson thing. You're like, oh, Clemson's better. <laughs> they got better coach. They got better structure. They got better players. You sit and watch that game, and you think, oh, it's not even close. New England's got no players. That's the best outcome. We're talking about that for, until Labor Day. Finally, Eagles Saints. Now, you're going to be confused by this. You know, I initially thought, well, Drew Brees wins. Everybody loves Drew Brees. But what if the story Sunday night is, holy crap. Philadelphia wins. Close game. Fourth and goal. Doug Peterson, Nick Foles again. Pull one out of there, you know what. And then after that, it would be the Eagles at the Cowboys for the NFC Championship. Yeah, I'll take that. Y'all, I'll take that. If Philadelphia wins another close situational game, let's see, they beat Atlanta in one of those, and they beat Brady in the Super Bowl in one of those, and they just beat the Bears in one of those, and they earlier this year beat the Texans in one of those, and they're getting into a habit that Doug Peterson, if he wins another one against a great quarterback, there's a Belichickian thing going on where... It is not a coincidence. Philadelphia is simply smarter, owner, GM, coach. We've got a Wentz-Foles controversy. I think Philadelphia winning close. Colin, what about the Breeze, Brady, Super Bowl? Well, in my scenario, Brady doesn't get past the Chargers, so that's not going to happen. If you're asking me what's interesting on Monday, what is the most angst? Kansas City wins in a shootout. Dallas wins, but Dak struggles. The Patriots get absolutely rolled. And somehow, some way, on another fourth down situational moment, the Philadelphia Eagles shock the world, and we can't figure out what the hell's going on. Here's Joy Taylor with the news. No, 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 no. no. Turn on the news. This is the Herdline News. So Steelers president Art Rooney II made some very illuminating comments yesterday about his disgruntled receiver, Antonio Brown. Yeah. Looks like AB's future is murky at best in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Rooney implied that Brown will be gone next season, though he gave himself just enough wiggle room to possibly reconcile. He was asked if he sees him coming back next season, and he said, as we sit here today, it's hard to envision that, but there's no sense on closing the door on anything today. We don't have to make those decisions right now. Whether the situation can be reconciled and happen back on the team next year, we're not closing the door on anything. And after the quotes hit the internet, Brown posted uh, this photo on his social pages with the caption, good business, hashtag boomin. Three things the Steelers' ownership is, patient, quiet, and tolerant. And all three went out the door yesterday. They're not patient, they're losing tolerance, and they're not quiet. They don't talk. 
This tells me, and, and for the record, somebody, Antonio Brown may not fit the Steelers. He certainly fits the NFL. As long as you don't build around him, he becomes a component to a very talented team. I think he's interesting. Well, I, I think the one thing that they are still being is patient because, at least according to his comments, they're not making a decision right now. I mean, it is possible that Antonio Brown comes in and they all sit down and have a conversation as men and work it out and talk about what went wrong and what they want to do moving forward. Yeah. That's possible. Yeah. Unlikely, but it's possible possible so maybe they are just waiting so closer to the season maybe after the draft and you know i, I don't know, remember what the date is for when the extra part of his contract kicks in they owe more money but i'm sure they'll sort it out whether they decide to keep him or not when the time is right they don't have to make a decision right now like he said yeah. so the nfl coaching carousel has officially jumped the shark after the packers hired rams offensive coordinator matt lafleur and cardinals the cardinals pointed out that sean McVay and cliff kingsbury are friends in their press release the Bengals are now planning to hire McVay's quarterback coach oh to be their next head coach. <laughs> Nothing can be confirmed until the Rams are no longer in the playoffs, obviously, but multiple reports are pointing to Zach Taylor becoming the next head coach of the Bengals right. this offseason. He'll be the third hire who is a connection to the Rams coach. So this is the offseason of the next Sean McVay, yeah. which we predicted was going to happen. Yeah, and it has, quickly. Yes. And yesterday, McVay himself spoke about this phenomenon. I think really what it is more than anything else is it's a reflection of our, our organizational success over the last couple of years. I think it's certainly flattering. Uh, it's, it's extremely humbling to even be mentioned in that. But I know this, the reason that, you know, people are saying those types of things is because the Rams have had success. And I know the Rams are having success because we've got great players. We've got a great coaching staff. And we got a lot of people that are working in the same direction. And I think that's key for continuity in anything that you do. Um, but but it certainly is. A, it's very flattering. And, you know, it's it's a reflection of the Rams. It, it should be noted, you and I both like Sean McVay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think he is really I bright. I think he is the real deal. No, no, I think Sean's totally the real deal. Um, I think we're jumping the shark on the let's find the next guy. And I don't think his skills are transferable. That's no, what it is. I, I, and, and that's what I said yesterday. I think that when you have someone who stands out like that, who has t completely transformed Jared Goff's career and turned around an organization that looked dead, you you have the spotlight on you. So people around you are going to get the spotlight too. But part of what Sean McVay is saying, and, you know, he's being humble and saying the right thing, obviously, but what I also believe is that he's also smart in putting the people around him who are great at what he may not be good at. Right. Like hiring a very seasoned defensive coordinator, for example. Yeah. Like you have to put people around you who are great at what you necessarily don't have time to do or aren't great at. And yeah. then they get the spotlight and it gets confused with what you really do. What I like that McVay has, and I think it's a really important component to smart people, he has self-awareness. Yes. He's like, listen, let's take a deep breath. This is kind of ridiculous. We're a great organization. I, I've told you before, one of LeBron's great strengths is LeBron's got pretty good self-awareness. Like, this owner's not good. My team's getting old. This roster's getting hurt. Le